Hi, I'm Zach Waters, and welcome to another episode of What The Gaff Stop Photo Talk, where I chat to photographers about their life and connection to the world through photography. Today's guest, photographer Tony Orthon, has been covering a mix of social and educational and corporate clients for over half a century. I only became aware of Tony's work when his book, The Best of Times and the Worst of Times, was published by Blue Court Press a couple of years ago. So I was eager to find out how the book came about and delve into his working practices and his thought and his take on life as a photographer over the 50 years he's been working. I discovered also that he runs the Greenwich Gallery which is down on Peyton Place in London and SE10, right next to Greenwich Town Centre. So we delved into his early days, the different stages of his life as a working photographer. We talked about his life at sea as a photographer and educator on oil tankers in the early 70s. And so I was sent off down to uh, uh, Cape Town. I had to join an oil tanker that was uh, on its main voyage. And of course, they weren't going to call in the port to pick up a youngster who was going to take photographs. I had to go three miles out off limits in a little tiny uh, boat and meet this enormous oil tank a quarter of a mile long. And it was empty, so it was very high out of the water. And they threw a a rope ladder over and I had to jump, get on the rope ladder and climb up. And and that was how I got to uh, see life at sea. We chatted a lot about his work within communities around the UK and we discussed how the best and worst of times came about. So it was obvious talking to Tony that he had a real passion for taking photographs and being amongst the variety of different communities around the world and in the UK. And it was the feedback on social media which ignited the process of creating the best of times and the worst of times. I also discovered he had a fascination for the English language and its colloquialisms. Uh, depending on which part of the country you come from, I've heard the alleyway called a snicker, a snickle way, girdle gad, snicket, gunnel, ginnel, genel, twitcher, jolly, twitten, gitty, gigger, giga rat, squeeze golf. And then I mentioned a book he'd published, which you hadn't realised had been published. You did another book called Tough. Can you tell me about this? It was published by Walden, I think. Walden Books. Uh, don't recall that. Really? The only other book I did was a self-published thing called This Is Britain, which... And that wasn't called Tough? No, that was just one copy that I made. If you need to look on a books and you'll find Tough <laughs> <laughs> by you. Oh. That's interesting. I think it's about £40. Oh, oh I'll, buy, I'll buy one then. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you get it signed. Um... So I was looking forward to having a chat with them. The day came. And I asked him what he was up to. Well, at the moment, I'm recovering from a few medical conditions. But apart from that, we actually run a uh, a community arts hub here in Greenwich. We live and work in the same place, my wife and I. And photography is a part of that. We used to have dark rooms and studios. Now it's gone a little bit more uh, digital, but um, there's nothing wrong with that. The Greenwich Gallery has been going for... Um, several decades, uh, was actually started by my daughter. She had done a degree in, in arts history and was absolutely concerned that it should not in any way be commercial. And so we only ever showed um, stuff that she wanted um, <laughs> and, and that she, she liked. Um, we never sold anything. So, I mean, that was, that was great. It was, uh, it was not a financial dependency. Fortunately, now in in COVID and so on, we've obviously had to close it down and um, we are uh, ageing a bit now and um, we've had to rent out the the space to another outfit who who want to use it for environmental and social benefit. And so as such, at the moment, the Greenwich Gallery no longer exists. That's a shame. It's been years of being able to show photographs and, and encourage people to come and see things, not as a art, artistic place that you've got to know things about, but photographs of people and things that um, very often bring back memory and bring back visions of perhaps the future. Yeah. Because uh, I think that my whole 
my whole kind of work now, particularly uh, in these days, is justified by bringing forward stuff that I shot 50 years ago, not for some grandeesement of, of what I did, but for uh, the capturing of those moments, which um, actually generate uh, uh, memories, yeah. and those memories generate comments, and the comments seem to be very useful in terms of revealing community attitudes, not only then, but, uh, but also now. You've been a photographer now for over 60 years, haven't you? Yes, I've been extraordinarily lucky to be working for a lot of uh, educational bodies and charity, charitable bodies. So it's never been a kind of commercial exercise. But somehow I've managed to keep, keep going and keep bread on the table. And that's been a privilege right the way from school. In, when I was in school in the late 60s, um, I was able to have a dark room underneath the, uh, the science uh, uh, lab. And uh, I, I learned there how to process and uh, film and, and, and print and so on. And that became quite fun. And I was able to share that with other people. And then uh, when, I, when I left school, I went on uh, VSO to Botswana, what was called Betuan Land, and, and while I was there, it became Botswana as well. There, for some reason, I ended up um, helping in a hospital um, doing the paperwork because it was run by a lot of nuns, and they, they were nurses, and um, they didn't want to do paperwork, so I did the paperwork. And in conversation at one point, somebody said something about photography. And I said, oh, yes, I, I'm a photographer, actually. And they said, are you? Well, you can take x-rays then, <laughs> can't you? And, and the only sort of connection was that uh, they gave me a book of, about how to take the x-rays. But the connection was, of course, you were processing film in those days. Yeah, and it was in three, ga three, three gallon tanks. And of course, I knew about processing film in dark rooms. Yeah. The only difference there was when you took the lid off, there was a, a mass of mosquitoes that would fly up into the air. That year in, in Botswana probably suggested to me that I wasn't a good enough photographer. And so I'd better um, come back and, and, and go and do some uh, education work. And so I went to the London College of Printing, which is now called something something else. Your mainstay over the years has been the charity sector, hasn't it? Well, yes. Um, yeah. And what other stuff? That's what I want to find out, because you don't give much away on your website. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well... The Best of Times, the book, which was published in 2022 uh, by Blue Court Press, a lot of that work stemmed from your task force work, your um, social action projects and stuff like that. Was there anybody else you were working alongside over the years, like newspapers, magazines and stuff? Not, uh, not newspapers and magazines, but a lot of charities like NSPCC, like um, it was called in those days National Association of Mental Health, it's now called MIND, and for an enormous amount of time working on adult literacy. And so in those days, we, we actually campaigned to start something called the Adult Literacy Resource Agency, and the government gave us a ton of money. And then that developed into being the Adult Literacy Unit, and then it broadened to become Adult Literacy and Basic Skills Unit, and finally the, the Basic Skills Association. And so um, it started with literacy, but it then developed much more into numeracy and um, all sorts of bits of education. And I suppose that my, my role in all of that, yes, was to take photographs, but was really to try to be part of the, the presentation of any work that needed to be or, or any initiative that needed to be done. So I, I used to be in charge of putting on lots of presentations in all parts of the country. So getting used to projectors and um, screens and making things a little bit different and um, yeah. perhaps um, having things in the round rather than having... 30 rows of people and a, a stage at the far end. Uh, we, we got the audience integrated and, and that seemed to work quite well. 
in doing that, obviously, people would see what I was doing and suggest that I might help in other other ways as well. I, I did some commercial work as well. For, so most of the work was, was certainly educational, um, things like um, children's holiday venture, which was something that uh, I did in 1967. I guess that um, where where it, where it really all started was I when 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 I went to college to the London College of Printing I obviously had to live somewhere and and somehow I came across what used to be called in those days a settlement now they're called social action centres but I went to a, a place called Bead House in Bermondsey and so that meant that you were in touch with a, a lot of things that were going on not only locally but also globally and um, certain things cropped up somebody went went ill and uh, I, I had to um, get my camera go down to uh, the south coast get on a, a a ferry and meet somebody called Bernard Faithful Davis um, who was the head of the Children's Relief International and my job was to drive him around Europe for yeah. four or five weeks while we um, looked at the work that they were doing uh, because the charity itself was started in Cambridge and it was Cambridge University students who raised money throughout the, uh, the year to encourage uh, work to be done uh, for children who were in need of care and, uh, and a holiday. Yeah, and so they uh, they had holidays, and and that meant that I photographed a, a lot of stuff as well as driving Bernard around. And somebody in in that lot said, um, "Oh, have you heard of Task Force?" And um, so uh, Task Force, which was something that was started by Anthony Steen um, in about uh, nineteen seventy, something like that. He was trying to encourage young people to volunteer to help in the community. Yep. And so I was sent all the way around, around the, the country to photograph not only what was being done, but what was the social need? What was the need um, to try and encourage young people to say, oh, I could help that little old lady. And so that became a, a real purpose, not, not only, as I say, to photograph what was being done, but what um, could be done if if the right uh, processes were, were put forward. And it was very successful. We had, I think, at the highest point, something like 30,000 volunteers, mostly school, school children, young people around the country. Unfortunately, somewhere along the line, something called um, risk assessment became the, the phrase. And so the whole thing then closed down and became... Uh, very much more of a campaigning body called the Young Volunteer Force Foundation. Yeah. Again, I photographed for, for all of that. I want to build a more in-depth picture of that period in the 60s and 70s where you were photographing around the country. I particularly like your Cardiff work. We'll have a little talk about that in a minute. You were born in Staffordshire. Yep. Take me back to that period. Take me back to how it started in Staffordshire and how did you end up is a 19-year-old on the streets of Cardiff shooting documentary photography. And then I just get some of your thoughts behind that. Let me just take me on that journey of what got you to Cardiff. Well, born in Staffordshire, I don't remember very much about that. I think at the age of about three, we went, to, my father got a job in London. My father was a, a lecturer in education, science education, and, he, and uh, uh, he got a job in a school in North London, and that went on for about five years. And then we moved to Cardiff. So I was 10, 11, something like that. We weren't a, a very wealthy family and we were very much middle class. Fortunately, my, uh, my grandfather was able to uh, pay for my education. And I, was, I went to a school, a boarding school in Surrey called Catron. Yep. So I was flitting backwards and forwards from Catron to Cardiff for um, six or seven years. Really, I did a lot of photography in Cardiff just for my own reasons, really. How did you start with that? Why? I mean, I think my father did buy me a camera when I was sort of eight or something, um, and I wondered what I had to do with it. So I, I tried to learn a bit about that. And as I say, when I was at school, I, I made a dark room, so I got yeah. 
um, and my father being scientist was always very um, clever about telling me what um, developers did and what they didn't do, although he didn't have experience of himself. I mean, he knew, knew the science of it all. At school, obviously, did lots of things one would at school, photographing games, photographing people, photographing trees and things that um, didn't matter. And that kind of helped me to understand that there was something connected between what you saw, how you saw it. And later on, uh, working as I was for charities and educational bodies, the the most important thing that came out was why you photographed it. Yeah. So f- photography is about what you photograph, how you photograph. And we nowadays in the digital world, we know we know exactly when and where the photograph was taken. Uh, but what we don't know and is not recorded is why the photograph was taken. And I suppose that's one of the, the strongest things that I want to contribute, if you like, to um, perspectives of, of photography because people, I mean, there are millions of photographs put on, up on social media every day. So photography is really... In a, in a sense, become less special and become very prosaic. And um, it, it takes people like you to uh, spend years photographing pigeons and mm. bird men um, in, in, in order to allow people to understand what, what was going on in those, in those days. And, I mean, your book of bird, bird men and pigeons is, is fantastic because it, it's something that I should think about 93% of the population have no idea about oh it took me that long to work it out myself as well to be honest <laughs> and to work myself out <laughs> it's a labor of love isn't it and i think yeah when i think about the images i've seen of yours in the 60s there's a fascination with people obviously there's a fascination with composition definitely good use of light and technical aspects and you picked it up very quickly i mean you would have been about 18 19 at the time, were you? Indeed, 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 yes. I think I was very lucky. But who was your influences then, photographically? don't think I, I... I wasn't sort of into the the big world of photography. And in those days, the, the, there weren't many books published. There weren't many, certainly no podcasts. I think that was for a long time afterwards as well, because we didn't have the internet. It was only really until the, the sort of 90s, the world opened up a little bit, or a big bit. Mm. But we had to go to the library to get books and the news agents and stuff. You didn't have really any influences then, then? No, I don't think so. I wasn't following anybody because, uh, because I, I, I mean, I, it wasn't photography that I was doing. It was, it was supporting the charity that needed um, a few things being said. And so it was a question of uh, what needs to be said. Uh, let's see how we can do it in a most useful way. So one needed to be aware of how people uh, communicated. And one of the important things is that um, anybody who's presenting must be aware of the language, the style and the concerns of the audience. And so the audience is terribly important. And so my photography uh, then was very much to do with, is this photograph going to help this particular charity with the the ideas and needs that they are expressing. I mean, for instance, as I said, I worked for MIND for quite a while, for many, many years. It was in those days, there was a movement to close psychiatric hospitals and and MIND was very keen to to make group homes in the community. And so people could be taken out of psychiatric uh, wards and put into group homes And there would be a certain amount of care that would be um, and support that would be given to them. Unfortunately, I don't think they asked the community closely enough. And the community wasn't very excited about having a a house next door full of um, psychiatric uh, patients. So my job there was to go into psychiatric wards and try to photograph the people there looking as normal as possible. Because that was the, the message that we wanted to get across. And, you know, the sister would unlock the door and push me in and uh, lock the door behind me and, and everybody in the, in the ward would go absolutely mad. So I didn't photograph that until I, I sat in the corner and fiddled with my camera until things had calmed down. 
and my job was then to try to photograph what might have been there yep. uh, before I came in. And in a sense, that's so true of many photographic exploits. Use the, the phrase social action photography, which I think was coined by Greg Hobson, because to me, social documentary photography or documentary photography really had a had a need to photograph every angle of what you were photographing because then it wasn't docu if if you didn't do that it wasn't documentary it was selective greg hobson coined this idea of social action photography which tried to encourage and engage the 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 reason for the photograph being taken the why uh, why the photograph was taken. When you talk, as I have done to a few historians, one or two of them have been kind enough to uh, to say that their photo some of the photographs that I took were uh, helping them in their um, historical realisations and, and comments that they were making. There was one yep. uh, picture of a, a little boy in Cardiff wearing a very uh, old... Um, coat and uh, the one historian said that exactly shows my theory that those days in the late 60s early 70s was the turning point between Victoriana and the current day and of course I, I was very pleased in that, that he saw some use in that that photograph but of course another historian would look at it and come up with a completely different viewpoint and so um, uh, that's why I think that it's quite useful to try and explain what was going on your through your head when you took that photograph. I guess that you're going to ask me what I photograph now, and I'm going to say I find it very, very difficult to photograph things because I don't have a reason to do it. Is this now you don't have a reason to take pictures or...? No, I, I take the take the camera to my eye and I look through it and say, oh, that's a nice picture, but why am I taking this? <laughs> There's no reason to be taking it. But um, I'm trying hard to overcome that and to uh, take some nice pictures. I'm still very intrigued by that transition from boy on the streets taking pictures to then going out and working as a photographer obviously you've talked just explain part of that transition to me how did that present itself that next step between shooting on the streets for fun maybe not really knowing what you were looking for but finding something you really cared deeply about what was that transition period between did you make a portfolio how were you printing your work how did it how did that next step come about well i suppose it was personal contacts and i suppose it was projects that that occurred. I mean, I had a friend who was uh, an artist and who had a connection with something called, it was a charity for um, boats at sea. And uh, they put uh, a library of books on all the, uh, all the boats, uh, uh, all, all the commercial boats at sea, because very often the, the um, boats, particularly the big oil tankers, would be at sea for six months. And they would have a very small uh, crew, and they'd get very bored. So this particular charity occasionally put artists on board and taught the crew how to paint and encouraged them to see things in a different light. And they were having a big exhibition up in the city, and they decided to send me to photograph what life at sea was like so that there was a context to the exhibition of these paintings and so I was sent off down to uh, uh, Cape Town I had to join an oil tanker that was uh, on its main voyage and of course they weren't going to call in the port to pick up a youngster who was going to take photographs I had to go three miles out off limits in a little tiny uh, boat and meet this enormous oil tank a quarter of a mile long and it was empty so it was very high out of the water and they threw a, a rope ladder over and I had to jump get on the rope ladder and climb up and, and that was how I got to uh, see life at sea and that meant there was a big exhibition in the city and that caused some useful contacts with people who said, why don't you come and photograph this or let's um, explore this a bit more. 
Tell me about the work you were shooting on the ship. Where can I see this? My Flickr um, thing collapsed, but there is one thing there called Is Life at Sea? And there's about 100 pictures there of, uh, of life at sea. Right. It was to, as I say, pro- provide the context of uh, the situation in which people, crew people, would get very bored, perhaps pretty annoyed with each other. People didn't express themselves strongly because they didn't want to fall out with each other because you're at sea for six months and, you know, <laughs> you can't have enemies. <laughs> you, can't, you can't have friends really either. So it becomes a very kind of neutral environment. So I had to try and photograph that. I was also very excited that I had discovered something called sound and I had, a, uh, I had bought a tape recorder. <laughs> so I took that as well and, and taped uh, the sounds of sea and the sounds of people doing things. I was fortunate because I was a, a supernumerary officer, which meant that I could be anywhere in the, in the ship. Yeah. You know, in my, I think it was my early 20s, I was still a youngster. And so I would go down, down to the, uh, the crew downstairs and they would try very hard to get me drunk. Um, and I would stagger upstairs to the officer's mess and they would continue that process. Um, it was amazing that I, any of the photographs were in focus, but um, wow. it was, it was quite, a, quite a while, quite a good uh, thing for me. Who became your influences in photography then and, and what did you eventually take from the influences? Eventually, Don McCullen, of course, I very much associated myself with the East London. He was brought up. I spent many years later uh, lots of time in, in Bermondsey. And so I was very, very much part of that sort of poor community work. He then grabbed a chance to, to go off and, and do war photography, which was amazing and different. And he was very, he is very morally strong in not trying to concoct anything he he was very keen to photograph reality and not try to uh, photograph something that wasn't appropriate or representative i think and then he came back and and as you know went backwards and forwards taking more war photographs but in the meantime in in dorset started taking landscapes and the landscapes look amazingly like many of his war photographs what was your camera choice at the time than in the 60s oh i'm never very good on cameras but i i think i had something called an exactor i think i then had two or three pentaxes and i seem to remember carrying loads of lenses around with me much later on i reflected that you know if you were walking around with a 135 millimeter lens on you were looking around you in the frame setting of a 135 millimeter lens. If you were had a 50 millimeter lens on, David Hearn always had and never had anything else, you'd have to walk and go closer if you wanted to be closer, or um, you stayed where you were and you took what it, what it was. So in, in those days, it was a question of changing lenses. Nowadays, of course, with these wonderful lenses that go from 24 mil to 1,000, and the effect that it has on me walking around now, it means that anything that I see, I know that I can photograph. I'm seeing a lot of 35 mil, 28 mil with your work. In those days, yes, there would have been um, 28 mil, yeah, I guess. And what was your film? Were you Kodak, Ilford? I did anything and everything that I could afford <laughs> at the time. I mean, uh, one was one was very conscious that every time you press that button, it was one and sixpence. You had to be very wary about over... I mean, OK, m- many of my clients were paying for my film, but at the same time, they were, they were short of money, so you had to be very careful and you had to try not to photograph loads and loads of things. Um, so you had to choose, and and sometimes I'm mean, I'm a little bit surprised that I uh, managed to get some photographs that seem to be of the perfect moment, and I think they were just a fluke, really. Uh, now nowadays you take uh, twenty in one buzz and um, you select the best one, but in those days you you only took one. Do you remember bulk roll film? 
Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Loading up your own cassettes in the darkroom. Oh, my days. Oh, yeah. A friend of my father's um, had a, um, a business in the, in the cine world. And when he said, oh, he said, I can give you a few off cuts of uh, 35 mil cine film. Oh, and he yeah. would send me a can, you know, and it would just be, you know, about 400 <laughs> uh, cassettes worth, you know. And we had to uh, try and load them up. And I, I didn't have a dark room at that time, so I had a black bag and I turned the light out and, and loaded them up under the sheets of my bed, made the, put the film in the canisters then. I think bulk loading was probably the, the worst invention ever. It was horrific. I remember in vain trying <laughs> to do it and getting really upset. I thought it was a cheap alternative, as you were saying, about trying to save on form. Oh, my days, it was horrific. It was actually close second worst ever invention was trying to use the sprocket you load the form onto in the dark room, in the dark, when you're putting it in the can, and that was just, that was the bane of my life. There's one picture in the Blue Core Press book which really resonates with me. In fact, there's, there's a couple of pictures. There's two pictures of the um, the adventure playground, the wooden adventure playground. In Cardiff, yeah. Yeah. I'm old enough to remember wooden makeshift adventure playgrounds. Can you imagine them sort of playgrounds now? Oh, they health and safety no way oh i mean so many of these pictures show that there was no health and safety in those days and uh, i mean the the creation of that um, uh, adventure playground that you're talking about beautifully done and it was it was the, the height of a telephone uh, post i mean it was amazingly high and kids there climbing up uh, and and getting there into the uh, into the little uh, uh, thing and zooming down I, and in fact I, I did that I thought it would be good to photograph as I came down so I went up there and came down photographing as I went and fortunately people caught me as I got to the to the end yeah. do you remember big slides oh yes do you remember in playground you yeah. have huge gigantic slides yeah. and, I, and you're so small I remember being so tiny climbing to the top top of these massive slides and sliding down and it was just nothing at the time but if i saw my kids doing it now i'd freak out yeah 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 your book the best and worst for me and correct me if i'm wrong there's two things it represents for me regardless of geographics and location because it's about around the uk but the two things which resonates for me is community and childhood I feel it's a bit about your childhood as well in a sense yes i was brought up with an older brother and we didn't get on well. So it was quite good that uh, my grandfather sent me off to a boarding school. <laughs> so I developed much more as perhaps I would have done if I was uh, the younger member of a family that was arguing all the time uh, with my brother. Um, so I, I became much more independent in, in a boarding school. And there were, there were always lots of things. And my father's, you know, uh, was incredibly good at opening doors for me in anything to do with learning and education. He would never, he would never prescribe anything. So anything that I, I showed an interest in, he would, he would open, open whatever doors he could find to let me uh, get involved in that. And so once again, the idea that photography is so much about the heart as well as the head, but it's an instinct that you feel that you want to be part of what's happening there. And so you go, if you're a photographer, you go and photograph it. I suppose I always, I've always had a bit of a dilemma about whether, uh, particularly nowadays, of course, whether you should ask, may I take your photograph, please, before doing it. In those days, of course, you never even worried about that at all. Nowadays, you kind of you know, have to get a form signed to say that this person allowed me to take this photograph. That has changed uh, things enormously, and I'm uh, very proud of the, um, the book that well, I'm not proud, I'm very excited about Mark Davenant's yeah. book about um, the homeless, because I became very much involved in a homeless charity here in Greenwich called the Greenwich Winter Night Shelter. It's very clear to me that all of Mark's pictures there he had a relationship with the, the person there. Obviously, he talked about 
who they were, what they were doing, what their history was, and what their aspirations were. But most of my photography, I think, never had that in it. Certainly my street photography, I suppose the stuff on, on board ship meant that I was involved as one of them. But I, I think I've always been sort of in a corner looking rather than going forward and saying, hi, who are you? What are you doing? Can I yeah. Can I help? Obviously, there's lots and lots of wasted photographs. I mean, yeah. tens of thousands of them don't strike the balance that some of them apparently do. It's a people's book. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of poverty in the UK, and that's been well documented by people like Nick Hedges, the Exit Photography Group, and so on. And the places where you were photographing, in effect, are quite deprived areas. Yeah. I feel it's, there's a very romantic feel to your book. It's more about the people in the environment. Say, like, Nick Hedges was really studying the slums and looking at that area of deprivation. That was always in the foreground of his work, even though he had people and incorporated people within that. Mm. And that was the mainstay of his angle in, in the work he did for the, the sort of housing charities. The difference with yours for me is there's a sense of dignity with the people. There's that, not a love affair with the people in a sense, but the, the image of this community. You were definitely into composition. You can see you were definitely following the route of design with your work. And there's little things within your street work where you positioned the woman in between the posts and the washing is hanging above her head and just little lovely things coming together. And I, and I think that's pretty good for a 20-year-old, to be honest, especially then as well. Maybe it was unusual then. <laughs> so it was just a, a novelty. Oh, no, there's a definitely a sense of heavy composition understanding in, in your work. For me, your work just is about the people who are part of this community and the actual geographics of it don't really matter. It's about the character, the people, how they fit into the environment and a sense of childhood. Like there's a lot of pictures of kids in an environment having fun, going about their daily lives. And then there's that grandmother figure, there's that granddad figure, there's that parent figure. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Yes, exactly. But I, I mean, in... in um if you like, defence, uh, I mean, that was what the task force was, was doing. I mean, they were, they, they, they were, they were opening playgrounds, they were um, trying to help um, old people to be um, more um, aware of um, the community around them. And what was so fascinating um, and what, what has been so exciting about these photographs finding their way onto social media has been the reactions in some cases, saying, ah, that's me in that picture. Yeah, and I've, and I've, had, I've, had, I've had people coming over from, from um, different parts of the country coming to Greenwich and saying, could I please have a, a print of, that's me standing on, on that, yeah. you know. And so uh, there, uh, again, and then telling me stories about how they felt, but also other people saying, oh, that's so-and-so. Oh, he was a really lovely bloke. He's dead now, but you know, it was really, it was really great, and we all loved him. And there was a whole the the community reaction, the the, the social and the historical viewpoints that that these pictures are now creating fifty, sixty years later is very exciting. I bet. And people say, "Oh, that's that's my aunt." How did you get a picture of my auntie? You know, uh, she her, her her son died um, two years ago. He would have loved to have seen this picture of her. You know, and and of course in those days there, there weren't that many photographs. You know, nowadays nobody nobody even blinks about seeing a picture of themselves because sixteen of them were taken at the same time and put up on Facebook. When these things, uh, there, there, there was um. In, in Derbyshire, there was a, uh, a little mining village called uh, Shirebrook. And uh, when the mine closed, they closed the village because the village was for the miners. Uh, sorry, it was called Poolsbrook, I think about it. Poolsbrook. And, and now, years and years later, they, and they have a, a Facebook community group called um, I'm From Spike because that's what they, they called their town somehow they found a picture of mine and after a, 
a while. They managed to contact me and say, have you got any more? And I said, well, about 360. <laughs> and they went absolutely wild because this was their parents' time, their parents' generation, and for many of them. The, the, was this the skinheads? Uh, the skinheads, yeah, and uh, some of them, and the children playing in, in really broken down conditions. I remember <laughs> the only time I've ever been approached. I was in the little alleyway between the ends of people's houses. Uh, and of course, at the end of your garden is the, is the loo, and the loo needs to be emptied. And every, every two or three weeks, there would be a horse-drawn cart that would come, and there's an external door, and they would empty the, uh, uh, the, the loo into this, into this cart. And so it was not a very, and sometimes they'd miss the cart, and so it was not a very pleasant or clean area to be in, but children played there. And I was photographing a group of children playing there. And suddenly I looked up and they had all run away. And I looked up and there were the boys. And they were coming down this little uh, alleyway. And I looked behind me and there was no way out. So I stood there, played with my camera a bit, and they came up and said, hey, lad, what doing? <laughs> I said, hey, lad, just take in four doors, like. Oh, thank God for that. They said, we thought you were some smoothie from London. Here, yeah, come in, have a cup of tea. <laughs> I couldn't keep it going, so I didn't. But <laughs> at least that saved me um, uh, the only time that I've been challenged. Just going back to you defending yourself. You didn't have to defend yourself. I was applauding your work. <laughs> <laughs> I was complimenting you. It's interesting you're talking about how people reacted to your work how, when you introduced it to social media. I mentioned the skinheads as well because that end, the, the skin, you were shooting at the Lady Gorm Club, weren't you, in the 60s, just some skinheads. And yeah. it ended up, it was, there was some prints found in the corner of a room or something, and they were your prints. And these prints led on to a bigger book being researched called Scorcher. The Skins culture or something like that, isn't it? The Scorcher book. With the context of somebody finding your images from the skinheads in a box in the corner of the room, what happened to the images which ended up in the worst and the best? What was the transition period? Did you just file all of these images away for 10 years or something? Yes. Uh, I meticulous because I processed all my own negatives obviously and you filed them away and you made a, a contact sheet you use the contact sheet more often than you use the negatives and occasionally you would um, think that you had to print up one or two of these so there are I don't know I think the last time I counted something like 15,000 uh, negatives in the early days um, subsequent to that obviously there were lots more and now, of course, they're all digital. But, I mean, there's probably 20,000, 30,000 negatives uh, in, in all um, kicking around. They're, they're all here. I have digitized all of them roughly. Many of them I then clean and wash and make sure that I get the best I possibly can out of them and then digitize them at high resolution. And those are the ones that got used in the book here. The... Um, the story of the Scorcher book is, a, is, I'm afraid, a new story to me. I had not um, quite logged on to that. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. I was in a, in, a, in a settlement called Bead House, and Lady Cargom House was, our, was where I had my darkroom, actually, and where I showed, where I encouraged lots of uh, skinheads, they would be called, um, to come and do things in the darkroom. They, they thought they were doing other things in the darkroom, but I managed to get them to do photography in the darkroom. Yes, there were piles of prints left around, and I guess that somebody picked them up once, but I, I wasn't aware they'd been made into a book called The Scorcher. The ones that I selected for the best of times, worst of times, uh, were, as Colin Wilkinson always says is that they should be black and white, they should be uh, taken in Britain, uh, and they should be um, of that time. So that narrowed the selection down a bit. 
So I then began to be putting them up onto Facebook, and there are lots and lots of different Facebook geographical sites. There's one in Cardiff, there's Staveley, there's um, Poolsbrook, there's um, all, all over the, the country, Devon and so on. And so I put these up with the help of one or two people who got excited about them. Quite literally, hundreds and thousands of comments, pages and pages and pages of comments. Yeah. That, to me, was the exciting outcome of all of this, was that for that people were able not, not to say nice things about the photographs and whether they were well composed or whatever, but just what it meant to them and what it meant for them to be able to recount their own personal history, the, the social history, the, the ideas that in those days we were all poor. Uh, we didn't know we were poor because we were all poor. And, you know, that was, that was okay. Life was happy. There were no, there was nothing to value it against. You lived your own life and your, and your community life. And I think that's really fantastic because we could learn a bit from those days and we could learn to make our communities uh, a bit like those communities were which were sharing and caring nobody ever closed their their doors uh, their front door there was always an open door there was always somebody to go and, and talk to or um, help you with anything that you wanted so how did the book come about then what was the inspiration behind contacting Blue Corp? Well, actually, it was Mark Davenant who uh, um, saw some of my pictures up on, on Facebook and he said, I think you should uh, get in touch with Colin. And so I did, and Colin came down from Liverpool um, to see me in, in Greenwich and um, he looked at some of my archive and said yes. And that was a very thrilling moment. What was your final selection before the book edit? How many pictures were you on? Well, I suppose I, I was selecting probably out of about 5,000, I probably selected these 100. I was very much influenced by some of the comments. Now, not all of the comments are actually about necessarily about those, those particular pictures, but certainly about those times. Uh, but where, where they are about those particular pictures, then that helped the uh, selection. I do like the context of the text and the photographs in the book as well. Also, I do like the way you've focused on one person two or three times. Say you've took a picture of an old lady in her living room and then you've taken another one of her. And I quite like that narrative, that just that extended insight into that person, looking at them in a different perspective. I quite like that. And there's a lot of text, as we just said, which runs through the book as well. For me, that is, again, it's more about community and childhood, again, going back to the way the text resonates with the pictures. And, you know, I think you were doing this all them years ago, waiting for this to happen, in a sense. <laughs> it's interesting when you look back. Hindsight's a really interesting tool, and I know what you're feeling because of where I've seen some of my work affect people and when they've seen their Uncle John who just died in that photograph. It's really special. You did another book called Tough. Can you tell me about this? It was published by Walden, I think. Walden Books. Uh, don't recall that. Really? The only other book I did was a self-published thing called This Is Britain, which... And that wasn't called Tough? No, that was just one copy of that. One. If you need to look on A Books and you'll find Tough <laughs> <laughs> by you. Gosh. That's interesting. I think it's about £40. Oh, pound. oh buy, I'll buy one then. <laughs> <laughs> make sure you get it signed um, <laughs> obviously off the worst on the last you've taken a lot of satisfaction there's a lot of contentment there what you've brought together with the pictures and people's memories and what you've evoked it's interesting that you're not feeling that now with looking out in the future and taking pictures and stuff like that you've just said before you were recording on the ship it's so easy to record now would you not think of doing something with audio and visual now well, yes, I mean, I have done lots of things for um, presentations um, that, for adult literary and ch charities that we were, we were working for. So, uh, I mean, there were lots of films and, and um, videos that I made that useful for what they were doing. But I, I still come back, I'm afraid, to this excitement about 
not being so excited about the photograph, but about the comment. Here we are. These photographs show how kids played and were never clean, but with healthy rosy cheeks under the muck. Depending on which part of the country you've come from, there's this little um, uh, alleyway. Learnt, I never knew this. Uh, depending on which part of the country you come from, I've heard the alleyway called the snicker, the snickle way, girdle gad, snicket, gunnel, ginnel, genel, twitcher, jolly, twitten, gitty, giga, giga rat, squeeze golf, alley, group lane, vicar's lane, switchin. Now, I mean, I, there's nowhere in my life that I've ever been except in this place in in Derbyshire to see one of those. And yet it's common knowledge in throughout the country in a number of different communities and they call it something different. And so the photograph, whatever we think about it, has generated something, particularly in, in my understanding, of something that I never knew. And so the usefulness of the photographs is bewitching to me. I remember my mum filling jacks with water from a tap out in the side of the road. No running water in the house and a toilet down the end of the garden. Bath night was a tin bath in front of the fire. I mean, I didn't. I lived through those times. I didn't have to have a tin bath when I was a youngster, did you? Not that I can remember. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing, but I brought up in the northeast, and it was an interesting place. In certain places, we still have outside toilets and stuff like that. What's going to happen with your archive then in the future? My son says, Dad, you should do something with it because I can't. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe it should go to. I don't know. I don't know. What advice would you give? a young 19-year-old documentary photographer now? I suppose it's a question of having a purpose behind what you're doing, and that's the why you take the photograph. If you're beginning your career, then set yourself projects, set yourself little themes, you know, and they can be pretty rubbishy. They could be a colour, they could be a shape, they could be a, a feeling, but walk out the door and try and see something that illustrates what you're thinking about. I think that, for me, was my greatest asset, was always knowing why I was taking the photograph. Thank you, Tony. It's been a real pleasure to have a chat with you and find out about the man behind the camera, the photographer. I'm now going off to race you to buy tough. <laughs> a books, a books. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, and thank you for all the work you're doing to, to recreate and uh, regenerate this. I, I keep on saying that uh, looking back is one of the best ways of the most helpful ways of looking forward kind words tony you take care of yourself all the best bye-bye bye-bye